In this video, we're going to discuss the failure of classical mechanics. Now, in the first video, in the introduction, I noted that when classical mechanics was applied to subatomic particles, to really small particles, um, it started to run into challenges. It started to fail at systems that were that small. So in order to understand this failure, um, I want to dive a little bit deeper into it and kind of take a little trip back into physics history um, and what was known at the time and how we came to to graduate to quantum mechanics from some of these failures of classical mechanics. So um, so let's take a trip back in history to physics in the 1800s. So what was known about physics in the 1800s? Well, one of the things that was that was believed in the 1800s was that the atom was the smallest constituent of matter. So atoms were the smallest constituent of matter. Right. So if you've spent any time in a chemistry classroom, you already know that this is not true. Right. You know that there are electrons, neutrons, protons. Right. We have subatomic particles. So the atom can't be the smallest constituent of matter. Right. So um, so we know that this is not true. But this is this was the prevailing physics of the 1800s, that atoms were the smallest building block of matter um, that we could envision or even theorize. So um, so that was widely believed. The second thing uh, that was widely believed was that Newton's laws applied universally. So Newton's laws of motion applied universally. Newton's law applied universally. And you may not fully appreciate why this is not true just yet, but you wouldn't be sitting in a class called quantum mechanics or quantum chemistry if Newton's laws applied universally. Right. So um, so Newton's laws do not apply universally. They struggle with small um, with small particles. But this was the prevailing wisdom at the time. And it's not that they didn't have a good reason to think that Newton's laws applied universally. Even in the 1800s, Newton's laws had had figured out some really tough problems. Planetary motion, fluid dynamics, elasticity, right? Um, electricity and magnetism. It, it was applied to a lot of different, really tough, challenging physics problems of the 1800s, and it succeeded in giving a good explanation of what was going on, right? So they had reason to believe that it, that it applied universally. Um, it was just a, a certain area of matter that they had not really wadded into yet that um, that Newton's laws did not apply to, right? So the third one, and this is going to require a lot of exposition, but um, they believe that the world is deterministic. The world is deterministic. And I'll talk a little bit more about this term deterministic, right? What this means is just a fancy way of saying that every time you get um, you get the same output from a given input, right? There's no randomness. There's no fluctuation. They believe that the world was simply deterministic. You you if you know the initial state of a system, you can predict its output, right? Um, the world was just deterministic in this way. Um, so I will say what this means, you know, it kind of in a nutshell is no randomness. And when we start to learn more about quantum mechanics, you will realize that randomness and fluctuation plays a large part in quantum mechanics. Right. So uh, the world is actually not deterministic, at least on the quantum level. And uh, and you'll gain a greater appreciation for that as we start to go through the course. Right. So, you know, let's do a little bit of a review of what Newton's laws were, how we're able to, you know, predict motion using Newton's law. Right. So Newton's law, again, was F equals M.A., where this A is your acceleration. Right. Tied to the motion of the object. The M is the mass right? how much does your object weigh? And F is the force, right? What are all the forces acting on it? Is there gravity? Is there friction? What have you, right? So F equals MA, this is Newton's law of motion. And, um, and you can use it to predict motion in classical mechanics, right? So for acceleration, right? Acceleration is related to the velocity by the following derivative, right? You have F is equal to M dV over DT, right? This is the acceleration 
written as a derivative, right? So um, acceleration is just going to be the derivative of the velocity with respect to time. And when you have this type of equation, right, if you took calculus-based physics, you know that once you have this type of differential equation, you have everything you need to integrate and be able to uh, solve for the velocity or solve for the forces, right? So um, so let's say, for, for example, you wanted to solve for the velocity, right? You wanted to solve for the velocity as a function of time. Well, then you know you need to integrate from some initial velocity v naught to some final velocity v of dv, right? Where do you get dv from? You get dv from Newton's law of motion, right? So you just plug that guy in and then you do the integral, the time integral now from uh, some initial time t0, which is usually zero, uh, to whatever time your time interval you're looking at. And you'll have F over M is equal to DT, right? Which you get from just solving the algebra here, right? So you can use this to solve for anything in classical mechanics. Now, obviously it's a little bit more complicated than that. It depends on the type of problem you're looking at. The type of forces that are acting on the object can cause this expression to get much more complicated. But essentially, this is all you did for the entirety of your physics class. Was we'll set up these types of integrals, solve them, figure out some motion, right? Um, so this, using this type of physics, um, implies three specific assumptions that don't hold up in quantum mechanics, right? So we're going to be looking at three major assumptions that are made in classical mechanics that do not hold up in quantum mechanics. And those, the first of those three major assumptions is measurement without disturbance. So measurement without disturbance. So what do I mean by that? Well, measurement without disturbance means that you can take a measurement of something without disturbing its motion, right? So a speedometer can uh, measure the, uh, the velocity or the acceleration of your car, right? Without stopping your car or without disrupting its motion, right? You can keep driving and it will give you the speed that your car is moving at without disturbing its motion. This is one of the things that breaks down on the quantum level. In order to measure a quantum particle, you have to disturb it, right? The, the way that we do this in quantum mechanics most often is to use some sort of electromagnetic radiation, some form of light, we shine it on the object that we're interested in, we immediately disturb it, right? It's no longer in its steady ground state. We excite it to some higher energy using light. That's a disturbance of the system in order to take a measurement. You don't have to do that in classical mechanics. You can measure things without disturbing them. In quantum mechanics, you always, at a very small level, you have to disturb something in order to measure it, right? So using these types of continuous integrals with the energy, is not gonna work because you have to disturb that object in order to measure it, right? Now, the second one, uh, the second assumption is again, determinism. Right, um, again, we just went over what deterministic is, right? Determinism means you're gonna get the same output from a given input. If you know the position, if you know the velocity, you can calculate the forces. If you know the forces, you can calculate the velocity, right? It's, it, it's that determinism that drives classical mechanics. It is not present at the subatomic level. At the subatomic level, there are going to be a lot of small fluctuations that introduces a lot of randomness. Again, this type of continuous integral over the energy is going to be a no-go, right? You can't do that. So, um, so that's the second one. And then the third assumption is that energy is continuous. So energy is a continuous distribution, right? Um, this one is not true at the subatomic level. Um, well, it's really just not true, period, but definitely at a subatomic level, it becomes a problem to assume that energy is continuous, right? Uh, energy is actually quantized 
What this means is that instead of a continuous distribution, energy can only be gained or released in these discrete packets, non-continuous discrete packets. This is where um, this is where the quantum it, or the quant, I guess, in quantum mechanics comes from, from this quantization of energy. So as we start to investigate further these failures of quantum mechanics, keep these three assumptions in mind, because usually if we're looking at a, a case where where classical mechanics fails, it's because of one or more of these three assumptions. Something here is breaking down every time we look at a failure of classical mechanics. So we're going to look at some specific failures of classical mechanics, right? Um, a few experiments that couldn't be explained by classical physics that we're going to investigate further. The first one is known as black body radiation. Black body radiation, uh, a black body is anything that radiates at every uh, portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? Um, so uh, those objects, their spectrum was poorly described by classical physics. And only when we were able to use quantization of energy, were we able to explain uh, the rate, the energy spectrum of a black body, right? So that's the first one. Uh, the photoelectric effect is another one. The photoelectric effect. So like I was talking about earlier, you shine light on an object, right? So if you shine light on a metal object, uh, what you can do is create what's known as a photoelectron. It's an electron that's ejected from the surface of a metal. Um, that effect is poorly described by classical mechanics. Only when energy is quantized can you um, describe the photoelectric effect. Right. Um, and the other one is just the existence of the electron as a subatomic particle. So electron as a subatomic particle. Right. So let me number these. So we got one, two, three. Right. Uh, when I say the electron as a subatomic particle, I mean, it's existence in the atom, right? When you use classical physics to describe an electron, you get some weird things that happen. Um, and it doesn't really describe the existence of the electron. Only when you uh, look at energy as being quantized and include some randomness, can you really, you know, accurately describe why we have an electron and, and how it, you know, quote unquote, orbits the nuclei, right? So these are three classical experiments um, that we're going to look at in further detail in the coming videos in this unit, right? Black body radiation, photoelectric effect, and the energy of the electron. Um, and these are classical failures of classical mechanics that were rectified by either some sort of base assumption of quantum mechanics or quantum mechanics itself, right? So we're gonna look in more detail at all of these.